Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our January ECAP Coach Webinar. We're glad you've joined us today. Um, before we get started, I want to remind everyone to make sure you have yourself muted. If you're using your computer microphone and speakers, please be sure to mute your microphone. We want everyone to be able to hear those who are presenting during the webinar. We have a few guest speakers with us today that we're very excited about. As we move through the material today, please um, type your questions into the question box and we will respond to those questions as appropriate during the webinar as they relate to the topic being presented. There will also be time at the end for questions. And if for some reason we're unable to answer your question during the webinar, we will follow up with you individually at a later date. So we'll start with introductions. This is Kelly DeBoer. I'm a pre-K specialist with the Department of Early Learning. And this is Tracy Kenny. I am also a pre-K specialist with the Department of Early Learning. And this is Sue Rose, and I'm no longer a pre-K specialist with the Department of Early Learning. So I just wanted to take a brief moment to say that I got a new position with the department on their early support for infants and toddlers as their family engagement coordinator. And I just wanted to let you all know that it's been um, one of the highlights for me in ECAP has been doing this coaching work with all of you. So I will miss doing this and have a great webinar. So today, um, we are going to take another look at the prompting questions that we've talked about in November and December, and we'll look again at the Learning Pathways document. And, and these pieces really are the foundations for numeracy skill building. We want to hear from you all about your experiences doing the suggested activity from December, the Teaching Strategies Gold activity. And we have special guests, Annie Delgetti and Lily Carrillo from Region 10 TNTA, who are joining us to present some information on High Five Mathematize and share some resources that are available for coaches. Um, we're going to have some coach conversations with Emily Wilson Edge about her experience as an early learning fellow and the work she's doing in the field around professional development systems for math. And of course, we'll have time for questions at the end. So why are we focusing on numeracy? Um, we've talked about this on past webinars. I'm sure this is a familiar diagram to many of you. We continue to refer to it because it's really the anchor point and the foundation for why we're focusing on numeracy this year. The data shows that math is low across all income levels for preschool age children. And ECAP is helping with this, but it, it still is an area of need. And our overall goal is to help 90% of children be ready for kindergarten. And by ready, what we mean is six out of six domains are met in the WA Kids. Last month, we talked a lot about assessment and teaching strategies gold. And Julie Flores shared some coaching strategies and resources that are accessible within gold. And we'd like you to take a moment to reflect back on any experiences you've had in the last month or so, reviewing that assessment information. And we're curious to know if you have any ahas or tips that you would like to share with the group. So I'm going to pause for a moment. I'm going to open the numeracy prompts. You can see this is the document we've referred to. And I believe we were going to look at assessment in following up about the assignment. So um, do any of you have any tips or comments, pieces that you are interested in sharing? So Tracy, I think you mentioned you looked at one of these. Did you want to share? Sure, I did. I looked at the Teaching Strategies Gold, the Opportunity Assessment Card, and the Shazam Activity. And so, let's see. Did you have that we can pull up? What I thought was really I do. helpful for coaches is right up here in the top right-hand corner, it gives us the objective. So it says Objective 20, uses number concepts and operations, and then Subsection B, quantifies. And then it had 
everything you need to know to do this activity. But the, even under the chart, so if we'll go down to the bottom of this page, it says assessing children's progress. It has right here the green and the blue bands and the level four activities and questions and things you can do to really get some rich information um, to record on your observations with the um, with the Teaching Strategies Gold. And what I like to do is to connect this with the Pathways document. So we're going to take that 20B and so we're going to go to right here. And what it's showing us is really this Shazam activity is an activity about subitizing. And so if you come to this, er, the middle column where it says subitizing early operations, recognizes and names the number of items in a set of two or three for the zero to 36 months. And we can see that that is 20B, the green and blue bands. And then if you go down one to the three and four year olds, instantly recognizes and names the number of items in a set of three or four. And right there it tells us 20 B, then green and blue bands. So something that is very um, interesting to me is that when you are subitizing with children, the expectation is that they can subitize their age. So if they're three, they should be able to subitize three objects. If they're four, they should be able to do four. And then if you come down to the four and five, it says instantly recognizes and names numbers of items in a set of five. They should be able to do five if they're, so those are the goal numbers and the pathway document really helps us with that. Also, if you go to the next page and we do, if we look at operations and algebraic thinking, we can find, you know, sorry, not next page, <laughs> next group. Got it. <laughs> there we go. We see 20B is on here as well. And so we can extend the activity and extend the thinking for the children who need something a little more challenging. Where a couple months ago we had talked about challenging children and that um, they, need, they need those little extra steps and little support from us sometimes. And so this helps us see that. And then the last thing I wanted to point out um, real quick, and we'll come back to it later, is the last page in this Pathways document I think is very helpful for coaches it's ways to incorporate math into the classrooms and then questions that could be asked. So here's another one of those great resources that while you're out talking with lead teachers and providing guidance and really having numeracy conversations, here's another resource for you. And that's great. What I Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. <clears throat> So, oh, what we want to know is, have any of you had an opportunity to look at these assessment opportunity cards, and have you used it with teachers? And I'm going to pause for a moment to um, look for questions in the question box. So if you'd like to speak, you can raise your hand or um, type into the question box and we will unmute you so you can share some of the ideas that you have done. Um, Annie, it looks like you had a question about where to find this document. So we've included in the handouts for today's webinar, there is, um, let's see, the printout, the PDF document of the PowerPoint and these documents are hyperlinked. The Learning Pathways document is hyperlinked in it. And then the other handouts were from last month. But we can send them again if, if need be. Um, yes, and Kelly, they are um, originally obtained from the OSPI website. So there are also right. other resources on there. I do recommend using their search um, window, though, and put in early numeracy. Um, pathways, and that'll give you all of the choices. So it's kind of hard to find right now, um, and they're working on that, but it originally came from there as well if um, people want to check that out. Great. And Becky, I see you've asked a question if teachers have access to the assessment opportunity cards in Gold Plus, and the 
the way to access those opportunity cards, Julie shared that in detail on the December webinar. And so there are instructions included within that webinar so that um, December webinar could be a resource for, for staff as far as accessing these. Anyone else interested in sharing how they may have used these with teachers if they've used them yet? Doesn't look like it. So let's move on. We do have a poll. Let's do a poll. For you today. I'm going to launch the poll here. So we want to know if you're currently using I-5 Mathematize in your program. Looks like about 77% of you have voted, and it's it's pretty split. It looks like about 42% of you are currently using High Five Mathematize, and 59% are are not using it. So great, thank you for sharing. That gives us some information. I can share those results. And so today we are very excited. We have. Lily Carrillo and Annie Delgetti from Region 10 TNTA sharing with us on High Five Mathematize. Lily has been an early childhood development professional for over 24 years and has been providing training and technical assistance to Region 10 Head Start and Early Head Start grantees since 2008. Her career focuses on day-to-day -day planning, cultural and linguistic responsiveness, mentoring and coaching, training development, extensive program planning and management experience from birth to five. Lily has provided coaching and mentoring to education management staff, teachers, and home visitors to implement strategies to support curriculum fidelity, improve child outcomes, as well as child assessment data analysis. Lily has maintained her class reliability and trainer certification since 2009, and she has a master's degree in human development with specializations in leadership in education, early childhood education, bicultural development, and a bachelor's degree in speech communication. So welcome, Lily. We're very glad to have you here. Thank you. Annie, Delget <laughs> Annie Delgetti has over 16 years of early childhood education experience and nine years of Head Start and Early Head Start. Annie has been with Region 10 TA team since 2010, supporting programs in the priority areas of school readiness, career development, and parent, family, and community engagement. Prior to her work with ICF, she worked in various early childhood capacities, including state-level positions in Idaho on issues of child care, PANIS, education and community action partnerships, as well as serving as an early literacy specialist and service administrator for Migrant and Seasonal Head Start, serving 450 children across Idaho. Annie received a Bachelor of Science in Child Development and Family Relations from the University of Idaho. Annie, welcome. We're so grateful to have both of you here on the webinar today. And Thanks with that, I'm going, to, I'm going to pass you control of the webinar, Lily. All right. Thank you. Well, I have to say, we're in the uh, still the first week of the new year, so I'm just going to have to say Happy New Year, everybody, and uh, just what an exciting year we have ahead of us. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be able to be here to present on High Five Mathematize with my colleague Annie, and i um, really excited about being able to show you some of the... All right, so our objectives today are really to focus and understand the importance in the development of mathematics in the early years, birth to five. We're going to explore the High Five Mathematize Guide and really think about who it's intended for. And then we're going to learn about some of the resources available and how to use them. But before we get started, you know, I really appreciated what Kelly um, and Tracy were showing us as far as, as the data. And what we know, even as early as 2002, that, that there is a significant math gap at, at kindergarten entry for, for low-income children. And what we saw today in the data really showed us that it, we're not just experiencing it with low-income children, but it's really across the board. What we also know is that early math skills in kindergarten predicted fifth grade achievement in math as well as reading. So 
what we want to focus on is that math doesn't just simply begin at kindergarten, but it, it really happens uh, as early as birth. And it occurs in a very natural way through plays and, and routines and loving interactions with adults. And when we think about uh, infants, they're all about exploring their environment. And when we think about how they learn, you can picture the young infant or the mobile infant crawling around on the floor. And I, I think of my, my little grandchild who's cu simply curious all the time. Um, and the first thing she does is she picks up an object, she looks at it, she ponders it, and then what does she do? She puts it right in her mouth. She has to taste it, she has to feel it, uh, and she has to know what that texture is. Uh, to really begin to understand what that object is. Unfortunately, sometimes they're little pieces of lint on the ground and we have to, you know, quickly scoop them up out of our, their mouth. But when we, look, when we think about, you know, beginning at birth, this happens through everyday experiences. Mathematics uh, not only occur in the everyday experiences, but we know that it it is truly available in children's play. And so while some young children are able to develop math concepts through their own self-guided discoveries, we know that high quality adult interaction support is really essential to maximize learning to move along mathematical development. So what are the aims with the High Five Mathematize Guide? The first piece we want to focus on here is that we're really looking at building on early Head Start and Head Start educational leaders' knowledge of child development and mathematics. We're also supporting folks to really utilize a strong research base about early childhood mathematics. And then we're also wanting to make sure that we use a data-based decision-making approach to mathematics education as well as professional development. And through this, we want to be able to provide that professional development. We want to be able to provide those resources and tools, as well as those approaches for education leaders to support classroom staff, family child care providers, home visitors to promote high quality math education. So what is going to happen with readers and users of the guide? What can they get, glean from this? We're really looking at, at increasing and improving math professional development for not just teachers, but also home visitors. And we really want programs to look at the data, to really use the data to make informed decisions about the math curriculum and FET family education. And that family education is really important because what we know is that the engagement and the involvement of parents is critical to lifelong success of a child. So what does this also mean? We want to make sure that we are individualizing professional development for teaching staff. And we know that not just within Region 10, when I say Region 10, Alaska, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, but across the nation, we're experiencing great teacher turnover. And so the skill sets that we have in the environments that we're supporting really varies across the continuum. And so that is why it's so crucial that we really take the approach to individualize for those individuals we are working with. So who is this guide intended for? And this is what I really love about this math guide, because it's not just for one particular audience. But who can use it? We're talking about directors, education content specialists, education managers, and supervisors. And I think this is something that's really important to point out because, you know, not every program we know has a, per se, education manager. Some programs have content specialists. Um, and then we also look at family and community partnership managers who may be working uh, specifically with home visitors, but also working with family advocates to support the learning of our families. It's also for home visitor and prenatal supervisors, family education co coordinators, and site supervisors. And I think this is something that's really um, important to point out because as we look across programs, some programs are not able to 
afford uh, a full-time coach. And so the site supervisors may be acting as the coach and providing that professional development. Um, it's also for training coordinators and then, of course, mentors and mentor coaches. And then we want to make sure to include master teachers and as well as the ongoing monitoring staff. And I think this is really important because when we're thinking about the implementation of math, the way that we can begin to track whether or not we're being successful uh, with our professional development and uh, the implementation, the ongoing monitoring staff can really support us in looking at this data to, again, better inform those decisions that we need to make to support positive outcomes in math. So when we think about High Five Mathematize, there are three specific areas that we can look at uh, that support uh, the user. And that number one is professional development support and planning. And the professional development support uh, can look very different depending upon the program you're actually working with. And then number two, supervision. And again, we use the idea of supervision as it may be uh, the site supervisor, it may be the director, it may be the family uh, educator uh, who is supporting home visitors. And then we're also, again, looking at ongoing monitoring. So I'm going to take us first to this particular guide. And you can find this on page 101 of, of the High Five Mathematize guide. But this is available on each uh, particular section. And Annie's going to cover the geometry and spatial sense a little bit later in our presentation. But if we look at this and we're thinking about data from a monitoring systems perspective, we're really looking at how, we're, how classroom staff are actually doing. And are we taking time to conduct observations or even informal classroom visits to be able to look at some of those behaviors and environmental factors that support those positive outcomes for children? And so we're looking at the, the quality of the interactions between both the child as well as the teacher. And if we're thinking specifically about home visitors, how are home visitors working alongside families to support that development in the young child? And you can find this on page 104. Then as we look at the idea of mentor coaching and reflective supervision, what we're really hoping for in, in terms of the supervision, professional development, is we're looking at the idea of being able to do a, set achievable goals and that we're really working together to problem solve, to improve practice, and as a way, improve those outcomes for young children. And so really what it comes down to, and you know this goes beyond math, but children tell teachers what they need to learn. And then based on what they need to learn, teachers then guide the program administrators, letting them know the kind of professional development they need. And so what we're really looking at in when we're supporting the staff that we're working with, we are really doing relationship building. We're sharing values. We're taking the culturally sensitive approach approach and utilizing the background knowledge of children who come into our classroom. We do a lot of self-reflection, talking about what is working, what's not working, and when it's not working, what do I need to do? We're also looking at not just observation, but utilizing observation tools. And as we heard earlier, uh, with, with Kelly and Tracy, the idea of doing assignments. You know, this can happen through not just assignments, but journaling and talking about those things that are working very well or things we want to learn more about or things we want to try or things we want to do differently. So what are the math areas covered specifically in High Five Mathematize? There's five specific areas. The first one is numbers and operations. The second one is shapes and spatial sense. The third one is patterns and relationships. 
measurement, and then time and sequence. So what does each math area offer? And I think this is also, again, really important because we're not just looking at preschool or infants and toddlers, but we're really taking a birth to five approach to supporting math development in, in, in young children. And the piece that is really nice in this guide is that they provide lots of different language to support math development. We've, as I discussed earlier, we have the ongoing monitoring, supervision, and professional development tied in. And then, just as we heard Tracy talk about some of the cards that are offered through uh, teaching strategies, this particular handout, a free, um, has worksheets and reproducible activities. And I believe Annie will speak to this a little bit later, but there are also video exemplars that have been provided to your department. So I'm going to hand this over to Annie. Here we go. So I think now would probably be a good time um, to take any questions. We can pause for a moment and see if there's any questions or answer questions that have been posted. I don't see any, let's see, I don't see any questions about um, High Five Mathematize at the moment. Okay. All right, great. So good morning, everybody. Um, this is Annie Dalgetty. Um, going forward with uh, looking at the High Five Mathematize resource guide, we're going to, I'm going to go through some um, specifics about the guide in a couple of areas so you can kind of get a better feel for what is contained in the guide. Um, I'll give you a quick tip about using the eClick website. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with it. Um, there's a search bar in that tool. I don't ever use the search bar because it doesn't ever give you the results you're looking for. Um, so if you need some information or you want to know something about um, High Five, High Five Mathematized, just use whatever your regular search engine is and search High Five Mathematized from there. It will take you to the eClick website and what you're looking for a lot easier than actually going into eClick first and then searching. Um, that's my web tip of the day because <laughs> that uh, eClick tool doesn't have the best search engine. <clears throat> Okay, so the first page that, can everybody see my screen, by the way? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the first page here is just the, the um, first page of the Early Head Start and Head Start Math Resource Guide. Um, and it, along with each of the sections, there's these little um, poems, or you could make them into songs, or, or whatever you want to do along the right-hand side here. There's some examples. Um, and each section has some of these little songs that are fun for children to sing, um, and it, they're good reminders of um, some things that you that teachers could be doing in their classrooms. So uh, in each of the sections, you can find those. So w let's take a look at number and op number and operations, and this is just to get a feel for what is in each chapter. And Lily went over. Uh, briefly what was here. So this is the way that it is formatted and it gives you page numbers um, for each of the areas um, contained. And then we'll see, we'll, we'll go a little bit deeper and look at uh, what these look like. So here is the introduction to number and operations. Um, so it gives a little bit of information about what, you ex what to expect um, out of children in this age group. Um, for number and operations. The one thing Lily mentioned, you know, the, the one of the good things about this resource is that it spans the birth to five age group. What we also know about a lot of the kiddos that we see in Head Start and ECAP and um, other pre-K systems um, in our states is that we get a lot of threes who are really operating at more of a toddler level in their skills. So, um, a good reminder for teachers sometimes is that even when you're looking in using uh, TS Gold, if you have a child who's really not um, able to meet 
some of those um, assessment items. Going back and looking at, okay, so what would, a, what would toddler development look like in this area? And is this child displaying some of those toddler, um, um, some of those toddler skills? And not really to assess at that point, but to be able to know how do I scaffold for this child? How do I, how do I really truly understand where they are and help them get to the next level? And, and this guide really helps in that also because it, it gives you that kind of precursor to the preschool age, um, what should be happening, what's appropriate for children to be doing and learning at that kind of beginning or, or the um, pre-preschool age. So that, that can be really handy, especially for those kiddos who might not be um, developmentally ready for all the preschool activities. Um, so here again, this is just an example of what you would find um, in the resource manual. Um, this is the adult support. So every one of the um, areas has this adult support. So it gives examples of what adults can do. And I, I really like that, especially when we're talking about that professional development for teachers. It's easy to go to and be able to just say, oh, okay, I can take this uh, um, quick little activity. Um, it also gives some ideas for parent groups of what you could do or what um, family advocates could do or home visitors could do. Um, so that really makes it a really nice resource. What I would say is several years ago, um, this resource was mailed out to every Head Start program. And teachers get this big manual, and we all know what happens to them. They sit on the shelf. And it's not because there's a lack of information. It's because that's really daunting to get an entire manual that's 100 and whatever pages as a teacher. So the more that we can single out exactly something that teachers have chosen to work on or we know through data that this is an area that needs to be focused on, uh, it's easy to find some really specific supports for teachers and give them those little bits of pieces at a time so that we don't overwhelm them. Because you know as well as I do that they're already overwhelmed. So if we give them one more big chunk of something, they're going to say, oh, you're giving me one more thing to do. So we really, the guide is a really great resource for kind of parsing out little pieces of information at a time. Um, so this next sample here um, is the, um, again, some more adult support, um, specifically for number and operation concepts. So this gives you the infant and toddler center-based and family care homes, um, some activities or examples of what can be done, and then uh, home-based option um, family settings as well. Um, and here is another sample of the number and operations. This is the preschool, a preschool example. Um, so it talks about um, you know, speci a specific skill like representing quantity, um, and then it gives you a, a, just an example picture there of an activity that you could do to help children understand, begin to understand that numbers also have a representation. There's a spoken word and there's a number, a written uh, numeral representation for that number also. And then here's an example of the adult support for preschool um, for number and operation concepts. Um, so again, it's examples for center-based classrooms or family child care um, settings, and then also for home-based family options. Um, I'm going to pause there and see if there's any questions. We do have a question. Erin um, Berkey is asking, where are the video exemplars linked? Um, are they on the NCQTL website or the ECLKC? Um, the, so they say that they're on um, ECLKC, but I have not been able to locate them. Um, we have, uh, I have the videos, and if you, if there's, I'm going to try to find where they're linked. Um, if I can't find them on, on the web somewhere, then we can get a copy of all of the videos um, to DEL. I know, I think that Peggy Brown has some of them. I presented with her this summer, um, and I, I'm pretty sure that I gave her those videos but I, on her um, thumb drive, but I'm not 100% sure. So we'll, we'll figure out how to make sure that you either have a link to them or have access to them. Great. Thanks, Annie. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions? Um, and, and it looks like Peggy does have some of the videos, so we can oh. we can make sure to find a way to get those to coaches. Um, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's just some more examples, and this is directly out of the manual also, which is why, one of the reasons why I really appreciate the manual, because this is a really simple um, demonstration of um, that representation of how many. And for teachers, they will able to see examples of how you could do it. So rather than um, you know only having one way or one example listed, the manual has several examples of every skill. So it's really cool to be able to just print off a couple of these or put them in a PowerPoint like this or um, you know just provide handouts for folks that just say, okay, here's some examples of how you might do this with kiddos. Um, and it'll give some teachers ideas, uh, but it also gives them um, a little more um, information to use so that they're not having to come up with everything on their own. All right, so um, let's dive a little bit into the shapes and spatial sense. Um, what we want to do here is just kind of get a little bit more into what is um, some more of the information that's provided in the manual. So um, each of the sections starts with a little phrase that we, we saw at the beginning. So for shapes and spatial sense, it's uh, you say ball and I say sphere, learning geometry makes it clear. In, out, under, beside, around, spatial sense won't let us down. Um, what I like about those little things is that if you say math to preschool teachers, you usually get kind of a cringe. Um, some teachers are really comfortable with um, teaching math, but for the most part, a lot of preschool teachers aren't, and they just don't know what to do. <clears throat> but if you look at it in the simple context of saying ball versus sphere, um, using words like in, out, under, beside, and around, it's things that teachers do every day anyway. But it's really more about becoming aware of when do those opportunities come up. If I'm already using some of this vocabulary, how do I scaffold um, a little bit more information for children about spheres or about other types of 3D shapes? So we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go along here. So also in the manual are um, indicators at each of the um, age ranges. So you have birth to 18 months here, and we're talking about shapes. So the indicators are explore geometric shapes using their hands, eyes, and mind. And Lily spoke to this a little bit earlier with her um, granddaughter, who is exploring everything, um, not only with her hands and eyes and mind, but with her mouth, and we know that that happens for infants and toddlers a lot. Um, but just the opportunities to play with shape toys. Um, we don't expect matching at this time, obviously, but we do um, expect that there's materials available for children that are safe for them. So the strategies are exactly that. Just what do you do as an adult to help um, children um, have experience with these indicators? So of course, providing safe play and art materials that have different shapes. Um, engaging children with toys or games that involve matching shapes. Pretty simple. So for the 18 to 36 months, and again, we know that some of our the three-year-olds that we're serving are really operating at more uh, toddler um, levels in some cases. So the, it, it's good to go back and look, um, especially when teachers are just getting kiddos at the beginning of the year or if they have new kiddos that are coming in throughout the year. Um, to get a good assessment of where children are or what they know about um, mathematical concepts. So this indicator is that it identifies simple objects by their shape. Um, so we're talking about simple shapes here. We're talking about circles. We're talking about things that they see on a regular basis, um, stars and hearts and stuff like that. Um, use shape words in daily life. So uh, uh, we know that teachers learn um, to, to do specific activities. Where we want teachers to be when we are talking about math specifically is integrating it into all parts of their day. So when they're talking about like this example here, there might be at the lunch table or the breakfast table, let's cut the cornbread into squares. Um, and then a little bit later, I like triangles too. How would I make cornbread into triangles? And really start thinking about taking math beyond circle time or beyond that small group center, but how do you integrate it into all of your activities during the day? Um, this 
the manual has a lot of good resources and a lot of good um, examples of that. So let's talk about spatial sense for 18 to 36 months. So here are our little toddlers. Um, the indicators are becoming aware of their own body and personal space during active exploration in the physical um, environment. Um, what we know about toddlers is they're going to explore their environment. They're going to climb on everything. They're going to engage with their bodies because that's how they learn. We know that that's developmentally appropriate. Again, when we're working with um, some of our kiddos who are younger threes, they're still going to be very engaged in that climbing and all of that, which is appropriate for their age group. And I think sometimes as teachers, it's it can make things difficult because um, you don't want them climbing on your shelves, and they, but they're, they're toddlers. That's appropriate for them. So helping teachers identify when it comes to spatial sense what's appropriate and what they should be providing for children so that they do have opportunities to really start to understand their spatial sense. And this is a great way to explain to them that you know the toddlers aren't being bad or, or young threes aren't being bad by climbing up on climbing up on things. Um, it's developmentally appropriate because they're developing that sense of spatial being. What does my body do in comparison to my environment? How does it feel when I'm going in and out of this tire? How much space do I have around me? Um, things like that. So it, it's a good um, strategy also for teachers who might struggle with that. Um, so exploring the size, shape, and spatial arrangement of real objects. Um, they hear and begin to use spatial language like up, down, in, and out. Um, so just you know, providing opportunities for children to actually be up, be down, be in, be out, and then label it as it's happening for them. Um, the strategies here encourage child to explore spatial relationships through activities and opportunities to move within his or her environments. Provide child with uh, various materials with which to build and explore. <clears throat> so here's the, a, a professional development example that goes along with um, the information that we just talked about. And I, I realize a lot of this is um, infant-based, um, but it, it goes all the way up through preschool as well. So um, it gives you ideas for um, staff working with infants and toddlers. And then it also gives a little ac a quick activity to do. So let's um, take a minute just to do this quick activity. Um, and you can write your responses in um, the question box. So it's use the three pictures below to help make a list of spatial sense words and concepts, words about the position and location of the baby and the baby's body, the baby's toys, or the adult caregiver all describe spatial concepts. So if you could. Um, just put some vocabulary out there. What are some words that you could use to help describe, um, help the child understand that spatial sense? I'm waiting. Let's see. <laughs> Angelica says near. Mm -hmm. um, Christine says on, in, behind, up, down. April says near and next. Yep. Erin says beside, behind, above, over, through in the middle, under, underneath. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So um, there's a lots of these little activities that you could use for professional development, um, especially if you're working with teaching teams um, and you're doing planning for a classroom. Um, it's really nice to just grab one of these and say, OK, let's do this quick activity and just think about the words you could use. What we know that happens with teachers is that even with great teachers, if they don't do the pre-planning and kind of have the words in the back of their heads, it's not always easy to just grab that stuff when you're in the moment out of your brain. But if you can take the time to plan for it and just have a quick list of words that you could use, even if it's just on a, a little um, index card or something that you could pull out of your apron pocket and look at quickly um, to remind you about some of those words, that can be really helpful. Um, especially for newer teachers, that can be um, extremely helpful for them. And even volunteers in the classroom. Uh, we found in a lot of our Head Start classroom, classrooms with volunteers, if we give volunteers some vocabulary prompts, they're much more likely to use them and help children understand some of those concepts a little bit better without a whole lot more prompting. Um, so it, it can be really helpful. All right, so let's take a look at um, geometry. So during the preschool 
years, uh, children learn to name the common 2D and 3D shapes, identify shapes by their attributes, um, develop spatial sense by building blocks, working with puzzles, climbing and playing ball with a friend. Um, so what we know about geometry in the preschool um, years is that it is about points, it's about lines, it's about angles, it's about surfaces, and it's about solids. So children are learning to rec recognize the names of the shapes. We know, we know that. Um, but we, we need to take into consideration that there's two-dimensional shapes and they're, what are those attributes? So they have a height and width, but they don't have any depth. So talking to children about what does depth mean? And three-dimensional shapes have a height, they have the width, but they also have the depth. And they also have faces, they also have edges, and they have corners or vertices. Um, so those are some extra vocabulary that teachers can easily use to help teach some, of, some geometry vocabulary um, and help children explore geometry a little bit. Um, so what are children learning? Um, geometric and shape attributes, the length of the sides is something to talk about with children, the number of sides um, to shapes. Uh, the sizes of the angles on the shapes are something to, to help children pay attention to. The number of angles, um, as we talked about, two versus three dimensions. Um, curved and straight lines. So this one is very important. I'm sure that a lot of you can already guess why. Um, when children start really getting into writing letters and their names, they really have to pay attention to which lines are curved and which lines are straight with letters and when they're writing numbers. Um, so it's really a good skill for children to understand what a curved line looks like and what a straight line looks like um, because once they get to kindergarten, they're going to be hearing all about curved and straight lines um, in writing their letters and the emphasis on um, writing is going to really help them out if they have that skill already. Um, and then talking about diameter, radius, and circumference, um, for shapes like circles and spheres, I mean, something that teachers might not think about on a regular basis, but really think, helping children to think about um, what, does, what does the radius tell you about a circle? Um, what does the circumference tell you about a circle? And just thinking about you know, how, you, how they might be able to use the things that they have you know, in their classroom all the time. I mean, circumference can be very uh, simple in asking children, have you ever gone to the doctor? and have them measure around your head. What do you think they're measuring? Um, something that most kiddos have had done, at least a couple of times. So <clears throat> we can start to think about um, and apply the information here to um, experiences that children have had before. Um, so let's take a look at one of the learning activities for um, geometry. So this is a good... Um, activity to do uh, with teachers to help them think about um, just using some of their uh, uh, tools that they have in their classrooms. The small wooden pattern blocks, um, they're usually colored um, and they're kind of, they're, they're pretty cool little uh, toys simply because you can use them for so many things. This particular activity is about putting the shapes together in different combinations um, and using the words like sliding, rotating, flipping, to help children understand what all those concepts mean and then be able to practice them. Um, and then the, there's the challenge to see how many different shapes um, teachers can make using one shape um, and then try to make at least five different rectangles using a combination of similar or different shapes. So these are things that you can have teachers practice with and again the simple act of writing down some vocabulary that might go with this um, activity for children can be really powerful. I mean, especially if they're not able to plan with their assistant or their assistants. Um, having those pre-written so that assistant teachers who are working at another small group can be using the same kind of language to help children really get the most out of the activity and scaffold their learning about shapes and geometry. Um, okay, so we're, this is the uh, uh, link to the manual. 
Um, we're not actually going to go there simply because pulling up the manual takes a long time, especially um, when we're live. Um, but if you need the link to the High Five Mapletize information, it's, it's right there. Um, so this is the, uh, at the very beginning of the book, or in a good way to remember um, High Five. So High Five, High Five Mapletize. To help our learning come alive, five math strands make us aware we can learn math anywhere. To teach is to touch lives is forever. So thank you. Um, we'd like to open up the floor for any questions about what we've shared or about the resource or any other resources that might be available um, to us that we can provide to you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Annie. Mm -hmm. um, Molly shared a comment that um, as you were talking about the straight and curvy lines, and um, she shared that um, their teachers use the program Handwriting Without Tears that's based on the long and short lines and curves, mm -hmm. and so that's a, a resource being used out there. Absolutely, and a really good point that it's really important to know what your uh, kindergarten classrooms are using. And the, and the language that goes along with that. So, you know, anything in um, the resource manual can, of course, be modified so that children, you know, if you can give them a leg up on the vocabulary they're going to hear when they get to kindergarten, more power to you. Mm hmm I just wanted, this is Lily, and I just wanted to add, uh, you know, as Annie was going through all the pieces of vocabulary and uh, the activities that um, teachers can do. You know, what we're really looking at is, you know, not just increasing math outcomes, but when we're thinking specifically about preschool, and we know that programs are implementing the class, uh, we also have a real opportunity to uh, build upon that instructional support area when we are introducing new language, when we're comparing and when we're contrasting and when we're asking children the hows and whys. So really uh, providing that opportunity to deepen their learning. Great, thank you, Lily. So Erin is asking um, if the webinar slides um, from Annie and Lily will be available to us too. Many of the slides were not in the handout, yes. Um, we will have those available after the webinar, and I will email them out um, to folks. I, we needed to make a few changes, and so I did not have that as available as a handout. My apologies. Well, it looks like um, there are not any further questions. Thank you so much, Annie and Lily. We're getting many uh, comments about thank you to you both, and this was an excellent webinar presentation, so thank you again for being here. We've really enjoyed collaborating with you on this webinar. Absolutely. We're thank happy you. to do it anytime. Thank you. Great. So moving forward, looking at some more prompting questions, we want to take, an, since we've just talked about some curriculum, we want to take a closer look at um, the curriculum prompts. So I'm going to open up that document. And Tracy, did you want to say more about curriculum in this area? Yeah, let's take a look at the curriculum section of our prompts. So I have three prompting questions here that researchers have found that we need to really spend some time thinking about in all of our own um, applications and, and the teachers that we support and we work with. And so the first one, how can you take activities shared on these webinars and from other trainings and support teachers in integrating them in a meaningful and sustaining way? So really, like, how are you going to use this information um, that is individualized and meaningful? The next one, if you have a curriculum that you use, how can you support teachers in increasing numeracy activities into curriculum planning? I think this is great because, you know, at, here at Dell, we're trying to highlight different numeracy curriculums um, and resources for coaches. 
but and we may not hit them all. You know, there are other ones out there. And so what little nuggets of information and, and inspiration can uh, be pulled as we're listening to all of our presentations. And then the last one, how can you support teachers in ensuring that individualized numeracy activities happen throughout a child's day? And that one I thought maybe we could ask if anybody had any ideas or tips or you know um, different strategies that you're currently using. And I hope as these as the webinars continue, you know, that we're building up that toolkit for everybody. Um, but if anybody has a tip, you can just send that in the question box and we'll um, share with each other. I know um, we're going to have some coach to coach sharing in a few minutes and, and maybe um, that's something that we could share out next time too. Excellent. So it looks like Christine has um, shared that providing information and handouts with examples at all staff meetings as well as at individual coaching times has been a practice they're using. Oh, and that's great because you know we don't no, we don't have the capacity as a community to coach everybody. So sharing it out at an all staff is really a great way to get everyone on the same page and and um, updated with the newest and the greatest. Thank you for sharing, Christine. So um, questions from the field. Um, la a couple of webinars ago, we had, let's see, we had a question um, came in from Ethna, and she was curious about um, what folks are doing in the field around tying their teaching strategies, gold, math, information to professional development for staff. And so we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, we also had a question, um, a request, I should say, from coaches to add the topics for the webinars to the title on the DEL website. And I'm happy to report that that has been completed. So that will make um, navigating the webinars a lot easier. So for those of you that um, are looking to a past webinar to find some some information on a particular content like Wells or collaborative, collaborative coaching or um, the Teaching Strategies Gold information, they are all now labeled on the DEO website and easier to find. Um, so a couple of comments have come in um, regarding the question you posed, Tracy, and it looks like Molly has shared that we have have um, all ECAP meetings monthly and all 16 ECAP teachers attend and we share information at those meetings. And Holly shared that they're offering a training based on the math modules that OSPI created. So it sounds like everybody's working on some things there. Um, Sean has the teachers choose an opportunity card for the week and then at the following week's coach teacher meetings he asked them to bring their documentation of the activity and then um, they sit down and create um, teaching strategies gold documentation based on their data. So great. Oh yeah. So moving forward, we have um, Emily Wilson Edge has volunteered to share information about her experiences as an early learning fellow and the work. Um, she's been doing around professional development and math. And again, this is in response to a question posed in November about um, what are what are other folks doing out there around tying professional development to to math. And so, Emily, I have unmuted you, so you are free to talk. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. I wasn't able to test my speakers. So I feel like I'm going to be reiterating a lot of what Annie and Lily just said, um, and with the caveat that this is in a perfect world, right? So we're, we're working on mm -hmm. these systems, and, um, and one of the things about the Early Learning Fellowship is it really is about creating teacher leaders and leaders within the um, classrooms that's not straight from administration to uh, engage I'm sorry, ensure alignment um, across all of the early learning guidelines. So we're really looking at math this year, obviously. Um, 
And we have been looking at it sort of the same way as everything else. So it really is data driven and that is part of the early learning, um, I'm sorry, the early learning fellowship is ensuring that we are getting clear information. So our program uses TS Gold and we also use creative curriculum so it makes it pretty simple to um, outline our expectations and then we really have to make sure that we're doing the training so staff gets uh, excellent information and um, is able to then put that in a way that is meaningful. Um, we do set goals for each child, each class, and then I sort of set them as a program. And just to give a little bit of an idea of what I do, um, we have four, I'm sorry, five direct service sites, and then I have three that are in a classroom that they also have a coach from CCA, and then we have four um, that are within school districts. So we have some sites in school district classrooms and then we have a subcontractor. So this is really true for everybody. Everybody gets the same expectations. Everyone sets the same types of goals. Um, so that is, that's sort of the crux of how we do this. Um, and I would say the most important part regarding math is that it is really the overarching conversation that we're looking through that lens with every professional development opportunity that we provide. So we do have large group professional development that um, has the math lens. We do small group learning. Um, we know that teachers love to learn from each other and it's the most effective way. Uh, and then with that continued monitoring and individual coaching um, that we're looking at the math component. And it's not hard to direct those conversations because the base of the conversation is the TS Gold data that shows that that's where we're low. Um, so when we're talking about math talk, you know, like Annie said, they really are doing these things. They just need to talk more about them. So um, when we look at things like journaling, they can have conversations about the shapes and lines and numeracy and those kinds of things. Um, I was in a classroom yesterday and they were talking about snowmen, obviously, because that's what we're dealing with. Um, and instead of just talking about the weather and talking about snowmen, they were talking about um, circles and what kind of shape the hat was and the, there's a bottom circle and you put it on top for the middle circle and on and on and on. Um, so they're just having those conversations and I, I will say that along with with teachers getting to learn from each other, having that constant interaction with teachers. So have we have monthly communication. We, um, I go in and make sure that they're setting their goals. They love to have me come in the classroom and show what I can do because nobody wants to learn from somebody that is just talking and they're not sure if you even know what you're talking about. So um, one of the things that that I did just the other day, I was in a um, housekeeping and they happened to have a little uh, half of a, an egg crate and so there were six of them and you can, it's really easy to subitize with those, right? So I asked how many were there and they were able to count one, two, three, four, five, six and then I turned it and we talked about how it was still a rectangle and counted again in a different way um, and so just kind of showing them that you can do that. Another one was being um, outside. I don't know if you guys have ever played the playground positions game, but going outside with a group and uh, having them all stand in one spot and then telling them to run to the far right corner of the playground or um, go to the middle and get on top or go around um, the, the play structure, whatever it is. So um, these are all just kind of ideas that we're doing. I will say the crux of it really is making sure that we are being inclusive of all of those different kinds of contractors that we work with, uh, making sure the expectations are clear and doing that monitoring and following up. Um, we really have to make sure that we are respecting everybody's culture as well. They, are, they can be really different depending on the organization that you're in, the location that you're working with, the types of students and teachers. So having all of that um, and then just really having that math lens on has been, um, has been beneficial for us. So that's what I got. Great. Thanks for sharing, Emily. Mm -hmm. what, uh, speaking of, you know, that, that 
awareness of the, the culture of all the different sites and knowing that um, there's so much um, variation, what are some things you do to um, go about just increasing your awareness and, and knowledge of those pieces? Because I think that can be a tough one. The first thing I do is talk with the teachers. Um, before I do any professional development, before I go in and do any observations, I just ask if they have time, preferably away from the classroom, even away from the school, just to talk to them and find out about them, find out about their background, what, um, what they want to share with me about their experience in the school and in the classroom. And I find that just you know, listening. I think listening is the most important, and noticing when um, when you might make a misstep, noticing if something is a little bit confusing, and ask those questions. I would say that's probably the just relationship building in general. Uh, and then looking at, we also I have the benefit of looking at their home visiting, um, and their education visits, and making sure that they're asking those questions of their families as well. Great. Thank you. Um, Christine has a, a question for you, Emily. She's wondering what your fellow's action plan is. What my fellow's action plan is? Well, I have to pull it up. Um, actually, my I, I would have to actually get in the system to go look at it. <laughs> um, the action okay. plan is around um, ensuring the math talk is increasing directly in our classrooms. Um, and then our professional development for this year and next year will be around um, making a more concrete plan for our program. Because we don't have a math, we don't use high five mathematize or building blocks or anything. We just use creative curriculum. So it's, um, it's shoring up our, our current resources and making a decision about our future resources. Great, thank you. Can I? This is Annie oh. Delgetti. Can Hi, I, Annie. Um, I just have a comment to add. Um, when we're talking sure. about all these math strategies stuff we went through, or what you're, it sounds like what you're working with a lot of staff on already, is also linking it to class. So um, making it one more strategy to use to help teachers in those instructional support areas of the class tool. Um, so it seems like a really good tie-in for that also, if, if that's something they're already focusing on. Yes, and it makes Eckers more meaningful as well, as opposed to just saying you have to have 15 math items in the classroom. How oh. can you take 15 items in your classroom and make them math items? Yeah, absolutely. That's perfect. Thank you both. That's excellent. Excellent feedback. Um, Heather, Heather posted just a general um, comment here that I'd like to share with you all. Um, Heather is really curious to hear from other coaches what strategies are successful in helping um, folks with Gold Plus aside, you know, um, aside from the webinar. Um, they're noticing a high level of need at many sites and they'd like to hear some, she'd also like to hear some of the coaching models that others are using and if coaches um, are doing more generalized coaching or, or, or coaching more holistically or more specialized by content expertise. And she's requesting there be some space at one of the future webinars or an invitation to discuss this on Coaching Companion sent out to webinar participants. So I'm happy to explore both of those options, Heather, and um, we can certainly create some space for um, that can, you know, we can highlight that in the next coach conversation. So because I know that the opportunity to talk to each other and connect with each other and hear what you're, uh, you're all doing out in the field is very val valuable. So um, we can certainly make space for that on a future webinar. So thank you for sharing that. Kelly, it, this is Lily. Could I just um, add something to that specific question uh, in, in regards sure. to it? So, <clears throat> you know, what, what we know is that um, programs cannot afford numerous coaches uh, within their program. It's just not um, financially, uh, it, it's just not financially doable. And so 
what we're really working with programs um, to do is, again, as we discussed through the High, high Five Mathematize Guide, is to really look at individualization. And so um, what we're seeing more programs doing is individualizing uh, professional development strands, um, doing communities of practice through coaching, um, as well as looking at, again, ways that um, they can provide coaching uh, via face-to-face, -face, or there could be some self-coaching um, where there's um, more guidance that is offered through guides like High Five Mathematize or the NCQTL in-service suites. And um, what we really look at is, number one, those staff in great need. And when we say great need, um, you know, maybe three or more areas of, of development. We heard earlier about the pieces on Eckers and the pieces on class. And, and if we utilize something like class and we're identifying that the classroom is uh, low in emotional support, uh, low in classroom organization, um, and they're low in those specific dimensions, uh, that would be considered a staff person with a great need. And then there's staff who have, you know, a, a strong foundation but may need some help in one or one or two areas. And so looking at that, we're looking at the dosage of coaching that we're offering to staff and the amount of time that we're spending with staff over the course of the year. And then, of course, um, looking at group coaching, where with those programs who have a real struggle of meeting numerous uh, needs or being able to do that face-to-face -face time, providing opportunities where they can meet with six classroom staff and to be able to do coaching and for staff to be able to videotape themselves. And then, you know, throughout the year, um, being able to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with the coach, but then they're also learning from their peers at the same time when they're meeting in that group coaching process. So um, that's, just a, that's just a brief summary, but uh, the long and of short, uh, we are really noticing that programs are starting to methodically take a look at a tiered modeled approach to supporting their staff. Thanks. Great. Thank you for sharing that, Lily. That's really helpful. And yes, we will continue to um, open up this conversation, Heather, and and Heather's agreeing absolutely individualization and working on developing peer mentoring and coaching um, is key and it, it's overwhelming the amount of knowledge that coaches need to hold right now as, um, you know, as coaches and um, we'll continue the conversation. So thank you. Um, I also want to let everyone know coach consultation is available to all coaches supporting um, an early achiever site. Um, this is provided through the Child Care Quality and Early Learning at UW. Um, coaches sign up through Coaching Companion. So if you have not created an account for yourself in Coaching Companion, you may want to do so. Um, all of the consultation meetings are virtual or by phone. And um, you can choose a different consultant based on your um, consultation needs. And so we have um, gone through details of how to access that on past webinars, so I'm not going to do it again here, but I just wanted to remind folks and um, make sure any new folks just joining us this month are aware that coach consultation is available. And that's accessible through Coaching Companion. And of course, we have another poll. And we are very curious to know um, how many of you now are using, um, have used coach consultation since maybe our last webinar. We've been hearing bits and pieces from different folks out in the field as we've gone on visits and talked to different um, coaches. And it sounds to be like it's been a very beneficial and positive piece, so I'm, I'm curious to know how many of you are using that now. Looks like everybody's voting. 
And Molly, thanks for sharing. It sounds like you had your second consult with Luis, and it was very helpful for you. So thank you. We appreciate knowing that feedback. So glad to hear that um, the resource is being used, and glad to hear that it's been very helpful. Looks like about 67% of you have voted. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll so I can share it. And it looks like about 32% have used it and about 48% of you plan to use it. Um, small percentage are not interested. And for those of you that um, don't know how to schedule these, again, you go through Coaching Companion, um, which you can access through your Merit account. And you can sign up right there in Coaching Companion. You can see each of the consultants, their bios, the, the topics that um, they have expert level knowledge in, and you can schedule right there. It shows their calendar in real time. So it's a great, um, a great resource that we want to continue. So our next webinar will be held Friday, February 3rd from 9 to 10.30, and we will look at counting and cardinality. Um, again, the, the coaching toolkit on the DEL website contain, is where all of our webinars are housed. Um, you can access that link through the, the PDF of this webinar. Um, the coach orientation webinars are there, the monthly coach webinars, webinar handouts, and the Wells User Manual are there as well. There's also information on class and ERS. Um, who to contact at DEL. So for any policy-related questions or technical assistance, you're going to want to contact your assigned pre-K specialist. And that list um, is accessible through the link. Um, for Wells, you would contact QRAS at del.law.gov. And for any coaching-related questions, you will contact me. <laughs> Flying solo on this now. Um, and thank you. We really are appreciative of all of you who have joined us. We thank you again, Annie and Lily. It was very valuable to have you here with us today. And we really appreciate um, your time. So thank you all for being with us. Have a great day, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you.